Hello, my dear friends. How are you doing? Hope you are having an amazing day and not having to deal with drama. Ready for new stories I have for you today? Let's go to the first one. And don't forget to listen to the end of the story, guys, to hear my insights. Enjoy the stories. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to leave a comment. I, 28 female, was adopted as a baby by John, 62 male, and Sarah, 60 female, who already had two biological children, Lisa, 30 female, and Mark, 32 male. Growing up, I thought I was lucky. My parents always talked about how they wanted me to feel like I was truly one of their own, how they loved me just as much as they loved Lisa and Mark. And for most of my childhood, I believed them. I thought I was just as much their daughter as Lisa and Mark were. I didn't notice the subtle differences at first. They were always there, but as a kid, you don't pick up on things like that right away. But as I grew older, things became more apparent. When Lisa and Mark wanted something, it was theirs without question. Private school tuition? Paid in full. New cars on their 18th birthdays? Done. College? Fully funded. Meanwhile, I was given a lecture on the importance of hard work, independence, and building character whenever I asked for even a fraction of what my siblings got. Don't get me wrong, I'm proud of the fact that I made my own way. I worked multiple jobs during college and paid my own tuition. I built a career for myself in marketing, and while I didn't have the same financial head start as Lisa and Mark, I never let that hold me back. But it hurt. It hurt that my parents, who swore I was no different to them than their biological kids, treated me like an outsider when it came to their generosity. A few months ago, we had a big family gathering. It was supposed to be a nice, laid-back get-together. My parents, siblings, and some extended family were there. We were all sitting around the dinner table when my parents said they had an important announcement to make. I figured it was something benign, like plans for their retirement or a vacation they were excited about. But what they said next turned my world upside down. They casually announced that they had revised their will and wanted us all to know ahead of time to avoid any surprises later. They explained that after some careful consideration, they had decided to write me out of their will completely. Yes, you read that right. Completely. The reasoning? They said they wanted to ensure that Lisa and Mark, their real blood children, were taken care of and that it made more sense to keep the family inheritance within the bloodline. According to them, it wasn't personal. It was just practical. They still loved me, they said, but it was more important to them that their biological children receive the bulk of the estate. I was stunned. It wasn't the money itself that bothered me, but the message behind it. I wasn't considered real family. The people who had raised me, the ones who had claimed to love me like their own, were telling me, in front of my siblings and extended family, that I didn't really belong, and they didn't even seem to think it was a big deal. It was like they were telling me I was getting a smaller slice of cake at a birthday party, not informing me that they were officially disowning me from their legacy. I felt sick. The room was quiet, and no one knew what to say. My siblings didn't even meet my eyes. I excused myself from the table, left the gathering, and didn't look back. I went no contact with my parents after that dinner. I couldn't bear the thought of speaking to them after what they had done. It wasn't about the money. It was about how they saw me how they always saw me, even though they pretended otherwise. I was just the adopted kid, the one they could discard because I wasn't real family. Over the next few weeks, my parents tried to reach out, but I ignored their calls. They sent me messages trying to justify their decision, saying it wasn't about not loving me, but about keeping the family's bloodline strong. I couldn't believe it. The hypocrisy, the sheer cruelty of their words. I stayed silent because I couldn't trust myself to speak without unleashing years of pent-up anger and hurt. And then my Aunt Judy, 58 female, stepped in. Now, Aunt Judy is my adoptive mother's sister. She's always been a bit of a black sheep in the family, but in a good way. She's a self-made millionaire who started her own business from scratch. She never married or had kids, but she's one of the most generous, no-nonsense women I know. She's always been supportive of me, and over the years, we grew really close. She was furious when she found out what my parents had done. Aunt Judy invited me over to her house a few weeks after the family dinner. She sat me down, and after I spilled everything about what had happened, she just shook her head in disbelief. Then she told me something I never expected to hear. She said she was disgusted by my parents' behavior and couldn't believe they would treat me like that. And then, in true Aunt Judy fashion, she told me that she was rewriting her will too. Except this time, 
She was naming me as the sole heir to her business and her entire estate. I was speechless. Aunt Judy's business is worth millions, and it's incredibly successful. She told me she had been thinking about who to leave it to for a while, and after seeing how my parents had treated me, she knew she couldn't trust anyone else with it. She said she wanted me to take over when the time came, and until then, she would start grooming me to manage the company. I couldn't believe it. After feeling so rejected by my own adoptive parents, this act of generosity and love from Aunt Judy meant the world to me. I agreed, and within a few months, I was learning the ropes of the business, preparing for the day I would officially take over. News of Aunt Judy's decision quickly spread through the family, and my parents found out not long after. They started calling me nonstop, asking to meet and talk things over. I ignored them at first because I wasn't ready to deal with their hypocrisy, but eventually I agreed to meet up. When we sat down, they started by telling me how proud they were of me for taking on Aunt Judy's business and how they knew I would be successful. I could tell they were buttering me up, but I didn't know why until they dropped the real reason for wanting to meet. They said that since I was now poised to inherit such a successful company, it would only be fair to share the success with Lisa and Mark. They asked me to make my siblings shareholders in Aunt Judy's company so that the business could benefit the whole family. They said it would be a good way to bring us all closer together after the misunderstanding with the will. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The same people who had announced to my face that I wasn't real family because I wasn't blood the same people who had stripped me of any inheritance, were now asking me to hand over a piece of a company. Suddenly, I became family again. I laughed. I couldn't help it. I asked them if they had forgotten the family dinner where they made it crystal clear that bloodline was all that mattered. I reminded them of how they wrote me out of their will because I wasn't their real child. And now, they wanted me to share my success because we're family. I told them straight up that Aunt Judy entrusted the business to me because she believed in me not because of some outdated notion of bloodlines. I said that if they really believed family was about blood, they should let Lisa and Mark figure out their own success, just like I had to. My dad looked furious, and my mom started crying, saying I was being cruel to my siblings and that it wasn't their fault. She said I should forgive and forget, and help them out because family sticks together. But I told her that they had shown me exactly where I stood in this family, and I wasn't about to give up a piece of Aunt Judy's legacy to people who had cast me aside. Since that meeting, my parents have been trying to guilt trip me nonstop. They've sent me messages saying I'm being heartless and selfish, that I'm letting my anger cloud my judgment, and that I'm tearing the family apart. Lisa and Mark have also reached out, not to apologize, but to discuss their potential involvement in the business. It's clear they're hoping to get a slice of the pie, but I'm not budging. Some extended family members have called me, telling me I should just make peace and share the business. But Aunt Judy has been 100% in my corner. She told me I didn't owe anyone anything and that she's proud of me for standing up for myself. So, Reddit, am I the a-hole for refusing to make my siblings shareholders in the company Aunt gifted me? OP's parents showed their true colors when they wrote OP out of the will because of some outdated nonsense about blood. Now that OP has something valuable, they suddenly want to act like family matters? Absolutely not. I think OP handled it perfectly by laughing in their faces, because, frankly, it's laughable that they'd even ask. OP's aunt gave OP this opportunity because OP earned her trust and respect. OP should not let them guilt her into giving away something that was entrusted to OP. OP owes them nothing. And now let's hear the community's opinion. Not the a-hole. They've made it clear for years that Lisa and Mark were the favorites giving them all the financial help while telling you to figure things out on your own. And now, they want to reap the benefits of Aunt Judy's success, all because Lisa and Mark are struggling? It's rich, considering they're the ones who had all the advantages. You've worked hard for everything you've achieved, and it's not your responsibility to fix their financial problems. It's honestly laughable that they'd ask for a share of something they had no part in creating. Not the a-hole. Family isn't about blood. It's about love, loyalty, and trust. Your parents made their priorities clear when they wrote you out of their will because you weren't biologically related. They showed you how little they value you, and now that Aunt Judy's given you this amazing opportunity, they want to weasel their way back in? No way. You owe them nothing. Aunt Judy's decision was based on who deserved it, and you've earned it. Keep building the life you've worked for, and don't let them drag you down. Not the a-hole. It's poetic justice, really. They pushed you away 
made you feel like an outsider, and now that you've been given a gift based on merit, they want to act like it's all about family. You're absolutely right to stand your ground. They've only come crawling back because they see dollar signs, not because they genuinely want to make amends. Your aunt gave you the company because she believes in you. Don't dilute her trust by giving a piece to people who have only shown you they care when it benefits them. Grandfather, Jipa, Our deceased grandfather that died before the outbreak of the pandemic. He was a wealthy man, working until the day he died. He was an accountant who worked for a big corporation, his own tax business, and teaching accounting. To emphasize, he was wealthy, but he had five kids. Our dad, our uncle, and three aunts. He also had a girlfriend, and he set up college funds for each of his grandchildren. Entitled brother, E.B., my 28-year-old brother. We share a dad, as our dad was married before he got with my mother. He has a wife and two kids, one of whom he named after g -Pa. He is our central protagonist. His wife, B.W., put simply, is a gold digger. Lastly, it is important to note that our father and uncle are the executors of g -Pa's estate. To recap the relevant characters, entitled brother, E.B., our dad, my brother's wife, B.W., our grandfather, g -Pa, our uncle, and g -Pa's girlfriend. The story begins some time after g -Pa's untimely passing. In his will, he named his five children. None of the grandchildren, my cousins E.B. nor me, were named. This is apparently normal, since our parents would pass down the wealth when they die. I didn't care. I was just happy to get my college fund, since I didn't have a great relationship with g -Pa. A couple months ago, E.B. started demanding the money he received in the will. Our dad told him it wasn't in the will. E.B. doesn't believe him, so our dad sends him a copy of the will. That should have been the end of it, but if it was, I wouldn't be posting this. E.P. thought that, as g -Pa's favorite, he would be in the will. They had spent so much time with him, and they had even named their daughter after him. After this happened, our dad lost his phone and all his contacts. E.B. wanted our uncle's number. And when our dad said he lost it, E.B. accused him of lying. So then he called one of our aunts. She told him he wasn't in the will because none of the grandchildren were, and she gave him our uncle's number. Remember, he has a copy of the will and would have known that he wasn't in the will if he had actually read the ducking will. I guess he remembered he had a college fund at this point. So he called the manager of his college fund account, only to find that it was empty. Actually, it was closed five months prior to g -Pa dying, though it probably had nothing to do with the fact that he used it all up to buy a $1,000 camera for BW, $5,000 engagement ring for BW, and $1,000 in classes for BW to realize her dreams of being YouTube's next big vegan nutritionist influencer. The total he got? $8,500, which was loaned to him, as it wasn't actually being used for EB's education. And... It's gone. Then E.B. called our uncle. Our uncle wasn't dealing with this crap, so he said to call the lawyer that dealt with the will and all that. So that's what E.B. does. And guess what the lawyer said? That E.B. still wasn't in the will. So E.B. accused our dad and uncle of stealing his will money. E.B. went on to continuously call our uncle, and our dad had to calm him down because he was so pissed off. The two wrote him a letter explaining that E.B. was not in the will. He got his money, etc., but E.B. clearly didn't buy it. We think B.W. was in E.B.'s ear, telling him they were withholding his money or whatever. So he called G.Pa's girlfriend. She thinks E.B. and B.W. were recording her, because they were trying to get her to say G.P.'s lawyer, the one that dealt with the will, was shady. She said the lawyer wasn't. They had been working with him for 20 years. Ultimately, she told E.B. that if he needed money, then E.B. and B.W. needed to get jobs instead of trying to get money out of a dead man. Oh, and that G.Pa was disappointed and angry with E.B. for wasting his college money and not going to college. This was a few months ago, and nothing hasn't happened, so I'm assuming E.B. and B.W. are done. Probably. I've never understood the whole thing about expecting to get money in someone's will. If someone leaves me something, great, but I'm not entitled to anything from anyone. How someone chooses to leave their money or property is their choice. Last year, I made the dumb decision to help family out. My brother needed a reliable vehicle for his family. He convinced me to co-sign and assured me he would make all the payments. Due to his shot credit, 
The car ended up 100% in my name, but I was assured payments would be made. Due to the car being in my name, I had to insure it for him. That never got paid to me. Every car payment was either late or reversed due to insufficient funds. My credit score dropped over 200 points in the last year because of it. I called every month to remind him. Then, the pandemic hit. My fiancé and I lost our jobs. We struggled through the first couple of months, and then last month, my brother decided he no longer wants the car because making payments is too hard. I can't let it get repoed and destroy my credit. So, now I have to figure out how to make two car payments. The best part is, I can't even drive the car. It's a standard. No one ever taught me how to drive standard. So now, I have a $15,000 car loan for a 2014 Ford Focus ST I can't drive, and legally, there's nothing I can do about it. Let's not forget the car was four payments behind, so I had to deplete my savings to get it caught up this month. Honestly, my brother doesn't even care. He's living his best life now, like he didn't totally screw over his sister. He even tried to convince my fiancé and I to give him my fiancé's car that's paid off because of the inconvenience of losing the Ford and that because the Ford is worth so much more than our other car that we wouldn't even be really losing out on anything and he still needs a good car for his family. I've told some of my other siblings and they all feed into this bull. He has three kids and a wife who doesn't work. At least the car didn't get repoed. You learned a valuable lesson, etc. The moral of the story is, don't let anyone convince you to co-sign, finance anything for them. Doesn't matter if they're family, they can still screw you over in the end. Oh, dude, sorry. Your brother sounds like a trash heap. I hope you figure it out. Is there no way you can sell it back to the dealer? I don't know how that works, but there's got to be something you can do. Best of luck. The car is only worth ten dollars to $12,000 at most, so I'd still end up paying the remainder of the loan. You're probably going to take a loss, but you've also learned a valuable lesson. If you get any crap from your family, tell them, one, you did him a big favor and he broke every promise about it he made to you, making payments and on time. Two, now he's asking for another big favor and trying to get a paid-for car and dumping an unpaid-for car, which you can't drive, on you and when you have financial troubles of your own. Three, it's not your responsibility that he's got a wife who doesn't work and three kids. And four, if they think it's such a good idea to help him, let them do it. My mom and I run a little farm with rescue and pet animals and often need help with repairs, etc. We found a handyman who is multi-talented and cheap, a lifesaver really, as we're chronically broke. So we're really worried about alienating him over the following matter. He offered to help have a friend look at our lame horse as she's a farrier in training and might offer ideas. It turns out she knew nothing about horses and came to learn rather than help. And having the memory of a pebble, she needs the horse's condition explained to her over and over while she can't help and won't involve people she knows who can. She has become invasive and patronizing, telling me what that horse needs when I told her a hundred times this is either not a need, not a priority, or not possible downright dangerous due to its condition, and the vet agrees with me. Every time she makes this a debate, she has been inviting herself to muck the stables for free, which I told her politely was not necessary. She runs back and forth hand-feeding the lame horse and carrying water to it, as if I'm not feeding this horse, specifically while the others are taken care of. She also bought that mare two blankets, which can't have cost less than $70 each. I told her this is not necessary, but she acted like I was just being irresponsible for not wrapping that horse in the blanket it already had, during mild weather. Hell, I don't have a warm coat because I'm spending 537% of my three-digit income on my animals. I have to double my Ritalin intake and send my blood pressure sky high just to function when she's here. I need one to two days of rest after each time, which in turn triples my backlog of chores. So she's not even really helping. We made a coffee corner in the barn, so everything they need is within reach rather than having to walk all the way back to the house all the time. But not only won't she make her own coffee, but impatiently waits for me to interrupt my chores to make her one. She also insists that I do fetch water from the house because our well water isn't good enough for her. It's safe. When I'm otherwise occupied, she asks my mother with her bad knee to fetch that water for her. After they had a fight, our handyman told us she thinks our animals are not in good hands. 
I told him I appreciate her good intentions, but she is wrong and overstepping. He agreed, but they made up and he started bringing her again. Awkward. That day, we sat down to discuss the horse, as they had offered to take it off my hands. I told them the horse was not for sale or adoption, and while I was talking, she was nosing through our medications on the table. She even picked up my mom's inhaler and said in baby speak, Someone ain't breathing so well. What the duck? Is COPD funny to you? Then, he actually tells me that they already leased a pasture and got a companion pony and are ready to take my mare. Says she would remain mine, of course, and they're just doing me a favor. See, I do have some legal literacy, and I would 100% lose that horse. He then said, well, plus she needs a horse for her training. Oh, I see now. And while I'm typing this around midnight, she is bombarding me with messages, educating me about how this horse needs to be rehomed because of hierarchy stress. <laughs> this is a herd animal, and herds have hierarchy skirmishes. Whomever shall I rehome this horse to? I wonder. And I was told I was entitled for asking my dad for financial help after he stole $20,000 from me. Edit. After posting this, I decided to put my foot down and sent her a voice message, politely but firmly telling her that she is not getting the horse. She lacks the experience to care for this particular horse. I don't appreciate having my competence questioned, and if she wants the blankets back, I'll give them to the handyman next time he's here. Then, I blocked her, but she did read it. If this wasn't clear, then I guess the wheel is still spinning, but the hamster's dead. Update. Handyman came as usual, without her, after he apparently told her he's no longer moving in with her or anything else that requires him to endure her, and got a ton of work done. He did acknowledge that she tends to take it too far and needs to learn to take no for an answer and allow other people to have other thoughts on how to treat animals. She complained that our place isn't sterile and that I'm not nice to the animals because of how I talk to them in between baby speak and stuffing them with biscuits. I mean, that's just how I am. I lovingly call my favorite horse a crusty crap cow. One of the dogs is a one-balled duck boy. My late cat, who I loved very much, was my most beautiful butthole, so sue me. He said he respects my decision to keep the horse, but would always happily take her if I do change my mind. I tend to believe him. He has expressed his annoyance with her more than once, and I think his support for her trying to get that horse was mostly based on me possibly coming across as overwhelmed. I don't know, sounds like your cheap handyman is about to become a heck of a lot more expensive when they kindly take that horse off of your hands when you are not looking. I'm so heated by this and agree with the other commenters. You need to find another handyman, perhaps one with a soft spot for animals and appreciates the financial cost of running a rescue. These people need to be barred from your property ASAP. They are encroaching more and more, and unfortunately, seems like they have zero respect for you. I, 21 female, have been dating my boyfriend for one year. He is really sweet and funny, but a few months ago he moved in and things have gotten weird. I run a pretty successful slime business. I make slime and post it to Instagram and TikTok, then sell the slimes that are in the video. I have one employee, which is my best friend, and we definitely can live comfortably. Though we do work a lot, 50 to 60 hours a week. I run this business in my house. I have a three-bedroom house, one actual bedroom, then I have a slime-making room and a recording room, and we package everything in my garage. My best friend is over every day as we make and pack slimes, etc. When my boyfriend moved in, he found out how much we were making and asked if he could join. I politely told him we didn't need another person right now and that I couldn't afford to hire a whole new person. I think he was a little upset but moved on. My boyfriend started complaining to me that he never gets alone time because my best friend is always over, but I told him that I had warned him about this beforehand. He kept making small remarks about the business in the house like, I wish I could park in the garage or is it really a business if it's just in our house, etc. He also keeps making remarks like, well, if I ran the business, I'd do blank. It was quite annoying considering I obviously know what I'm doing. He also made comments like, if you and your best friend end up not working out, I can work for you. We have been best friends for over 10 years. Or what would happen if you guys got into a fight? Would she still work for you? And etc. But now, weird stuff is happening, and I'm worried my boyfriend is the cause of it. 
My business is 100% legal. I have all the permits. My best friend is an actual employee, and I have a cousin who helps me with all of the taxes. My boyfriend has no clue about that because why would I need to talk about that? He made a small comment to me before he left to work saying, it must be nice getting all that untaxed money, and left. I didn't correct him because I just assumed it was jealousy. He's upset I make more than him while he is full-time, while I get to play with slime all day. Well, after that comment, a few weeks later, I got a random audit. I obviously passed, but I started growing suspicion. Now, for the past two weeks, all of our slime activators have been different and not working well at all. I've gotten a couple of bad reviews on it, and I assumed it was the company who somehow messed it up. I bought some new ones, and they worked perfectly. Everything was fine until a couple of days later the activator was useless again. I decided to set up a small camera in the slime making room, and I opened a new bottle and started using that. Then, once again after a few days, it was garbage. I looked into the camera memory, and I see my boyfriend pouring water into the activator. The activator is clear. He also was on my computer for 45 minutes doing I'm not sure what. The screen was just all white because of the camera, and he took a few pictures on his phone of my computer. I don't know what to do. To me, he is acting perfectly normal, like he's truly and deeply in love with me. But then he's trying to ruin something that I've worked so hard on. I really don't know what to do anymore. Any advice would help. Break up with him. This man is obviously toxic. He doesn't have your best interest at heart, and he is actively trying to sabotage your reputation and your livelihood because he's jealous. Find a man who's happy that you're doing well for yourself. I would pack up his things, leave them on the porch, send the video to him, then ghost him. Don't allow him to try to give you an excuse. Good luck. I would also send a pic to those who have posted a negative review explaining you discovered the problem. Your ex.